Hello, everybody, and welcome to a first episode of a brand new show. Uh, I've been wanting to do this show for a long time, and I had an opportunity to basically partner up on this show with gentlemen here on the screen with me, Mr. Bill Elson. Um, and we wanted to kick it off with a really great guest that we both know. Uh, so, Bill, good morning. Good, Good to morning. see you, my friend. How are Hi, you? Hi, nice to see you. This is going to be very exciting, and thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. I think I think both of us have been in this industry long enough. We wanted to just take a little different direction to some yeah. of the shows that are out there, uh, bringing you exciting people, people that we've known, people that have a depth in the industry, uh, talk about certain things from different perspectives, both commercial and residential. Again, reach out, reach out to Bill and I. We are all over social media. If you have any ideas for shows or people, or if you're interested in being on the show, and let us know, and we will definitely uh, enjoy having you on as our guest. So with that being said, welcome, everybody, to the first episode of Design Sense. And the underlying premise is, if it doesn't make sense, you shouldn't be spending dollars and cents on it. Okay. Right. Everybody, everybody can spend money. That's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily translate to good design. And uh, Bill, with that being said, would you please tell everybody who we have on as a real special treat for them for this first episode? Thank you, Rad. Uh, we have internationally renowned interior designer of luxury hotels, Kirk Nix, who's based in Los Angeles but he has done work for um, Steve Wynn, uh, Caesar's Palace, Starwood uh, the, uh, in Macau. He's done work for the Venetian for Sheldon Allison, and also he's done a lot of work for Disney. Yep. Uh, he's also uh, helped those hotelers with their own personal homes, and he has a line of furniture, mirrors, rugs, and fabric. So yep. we would like you all to please welcome Kurt Nix. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Kirk on here. I've known Kirk for since probably about the mid-90s, and uh, our, our, our paths crossed when I first started in the industry, and he is one of the most talented people I know, and his work has been really solid all the way through. So let me see if I can get Kirk in from the green room. Okay. Maybe he can join us here. Kirk, are you ready for this? There I'm he is. <laughs> always ready. You are always, always ready. ready. That's true. <laughs> Always ready. Whatever you need. So, uh, uh, very good, man. And really, really, really nice to see you. Um, I can't. I was just saying very briefly how long we've known each other, and uh, and you know when I when I first started on the path of design, you have you have always been somebody I've looked to, up to to their work that inspired by. Um, you know, we listed Disney and Win and all that stuff. I mean, it's just you've been around for a while, and you've been doing really good caliber work and a variety of it. So uh, thank you so much for being the first guest well, on this show. Kind. Like I said, I tell people I started when I was 11 because, you know, we don't want to make any references to my well, age, well, right? Well, you, no. You, I'm like you, a fine you, wine. I just get better as I get older. You know, we're going to talk about uh, timeless design. Uh -huh. you, you, you don't age, okay? You do not get – you are, you are the same person I met in the late 90s. I mean, you don't age. What is your secret exactly? Do you even want to talk about that? <laughs> Uh, you know what? It's like, you know, I get up every day. I enjoy what the heck we do. And, you know, it's like you just got to commit. Yeah. And it's about, you know, making sure that you're thoroughly engaged in life and making sure that you're giving back all you possibly can. And, you know, also, it's you got to stay away from the hog and dust bars somewhere along the way. Because <laughs> me, and, me and food had to break up somewhere around 1984. And, you know, that's actually served me well. well but yeah, me, I'm telling you, if I was left to my own devices, I'd bring captains back in style and I would easily weigh 700 pounds. <laughs> you know, you'd probably make both of those look very good. So I, know I will look forward <laughs> to that design trend if it ever comes. Let me ask <laughs> you ahead. something. Let me just ask you something really, really very basic. Okay. Sure. I mean, we've been, we've been, people that have been doing this for a very long time, we, we in passing and when we talk to students and things of that nature, we will say, you know, you have to have a passion for this. That if it there's a pa it's a passion pursuit, okay? Yeah. Do you do you still wake up most days invigorated that way? Um, 
And, and what is it, and I'm going to start with this, although it's, you know, it was down further on my list. What is it that, you, that, that you're passionate about? Like, what is it that keeps you going in this industry? Because it, there's a, there's a, it's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of, especially yeah. if you're committed to it, right? There's a lot of deadlines. There's a lot mm -hmm. of stresses. There's a lot of emotionality dealing with clients, you know, meeting mm -hmm. expectations, managing yeah. expectations, you know, what are, what are you today? Are you their best friend? Are you their, you know, mm -hmm. what, what makes you continue to want to do this and feel passionate about it? Well, for just for me personally, I mean, yeah. just speaking off, off, I mean, it's a natural curiosity because, you know, I've always been a curious person. I'm always interested in what's around the corner. Yeah. But what's actually sort of given, I think, k &A, the firm, and maybe myself a little bit on the side, a little longevity is diversity. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I started in the industry many, many years ago um, in Atlanta working for a young, uh, young designer by the name of Stan Topol. And we were doing a lot of peasant restaurants and we were also doing some very large sort of magnificent homes in Buckhead, that sort of thing. Right. And that was a lot of fun for me. And then somewhere around, 19, you know, in the mid 80s, I got a call um, from someone who said, listen, you know, we're, it was a local firm and they'd been asked to do the first Disney owned and operated hotel. And I had never given a second thought to doing A, a hotel and B, working for Disney. I mean, it just sounded nuts to me at the time. And it was working with Robert Stern and the, um, the Yacht and Beach Club Resorts in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And so I went over and met with the, the, with the owner of the company. His name was Hugh Latta at the time at Design Continuum. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, you know, listen, it's got to be all custom. Everything's thoroughly themed. And that led to a relationship for me with um, Wing Chow, who was director of architecture and master planning for Disney, yeah. and Michael Eisner and his wife, Jane. And it's just amazing how your curiosity can just sort of write the script of your life. You know, it just leads you from one thing to another. And it all happened very organically. We ended up doing the Yacht and Beach Club Resort. That was a great experience for me. I met some wonderful people. We did the Newport Bay Club at Paris Disneyland. And then after that, I got a call from Michael Eisner's wife, Jane, that I had sort of befriended. And she said, listen, we're working with California designers out here that don't do what you do. And she literally, I mean, put me on the spot on the phone. I was at the office and she's like, have you ever thought about living in California? I was living <laughs> in Atlanta. And I was like, well, I said, I watched the bold and the beautiful. They're also tan and good looking. <laughs> I mean, I don't own a convertible. I'm not sure I would fit in. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I ended up coming out here and that was 30 years ago this year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like, you know, it's just a script of my life. So what keeps me going is just the natural curiosity and all the different things we've been able to do. Um, you know, we've ended up working in Vegas a great deal, which, you know, doing casinos, that was a whole nother planet for us to yeah. learn. We did the MGM Casino Resort in National Harbor recently, just opened that. And that was a great experience. I had learned things about casino floors I, I, mean, I never dreamed of. It right. was fantastic. Well, and, and, then, and, and, and your hunger, that hunger for, and thirst for curiosity and, and, and sort of, you know, is, goes hand in hand with personal growth, right? And once you get into that, you get that bug where you're, you're learning, you're, you're expressing yourself, you're continuing to take the next corner, you know, the, the sort of the, the mystery of not knowing this problem solving challenge, all of those things start to play a role in your, your daily DNA almost, right? Well, and if you're not growing, you're just stagnant and that's not fun. I right. mean, we just finished a house in, um, you know, and again, high-end residential has been interesting for us and it's continued to help us evolve as a business because we've ended up doing like, I, you know, quite a bit of purchasing, you know, so mm -hmm. we've learned how to do that and work with the vendors directly. And it's all about like, you know, product integrity and um, design sensibility and all that sort of thing. So it's brought us into another sort of leg or sort of arm of the industry mm -hmm. where we've had so much to learn, but you know, we've risen to the challenge. I mean, the house we just finished at Crystal Cove in Newport Beach was 67,000 square feet. It's insanity. Oh. Yeah, it's a mini, it's a mini, it's a mini hotel. I mean, I, you know, I, I could learn to love it, but it's like, uh, it's a little too much housekeeping for me. I don't have that much pledge in my pantry. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Can, trying to imagine doing that now with the coronavirus, like sanitization process, yeah. right? 
Yeah. Well, 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 but but you know you know to be to be candid, a house like that probably comes with about seven other people that are sequestering with you, right? I mean, so there's 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 people that are taking care of that function. Everything. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an extended family in there, and they're and they're on um, the full time staff, and you know what? They haven't left the house in seven weeks, so. You know, God bless them. It's like, yeah. you know, I'm sure I'm sure they're getting a little stir crazy. I talked to them last week and they're like, okay, is it over yet? And I'm like, no, not quite. But we're well, close. Well, and, 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 and you know, you raise a kind of an interesting point because I tell people that, you know, when it gets to a certain scale, even if it's residential, it has a logistics exercise component to it. There is uh -huh. a, obviously a budgetary component. There's no such thing as no budget. I mean, even at the high numbers, there's still some considerations that have to go in place. But you know, we've learned a long time ago. I mean, that creative creativity comes with like trying to get the best possible product for the lowest possible price. Right, and everybody's and looking for a deal, right? That I mean, applies across the board. I mean, hospitality, residential. It's like people want the most they can possibly get for the least amount of money. So, so let's let's focus on that for a second. So, so from the perspective of business of design, I mean, you you have worked for no, notable firms. You've you've worked regionally. You've worked internationally. Uh, you've yeah. had your own firm. You've had your own kind of under your own flag successes and uh, and a lot of them. What do you think about the the nature of the business side of this industry now? Um, and, and what is it that maybe we could do better? What are things that are some exciting things that we could maybe embrace? I don't know. I mean, for me, it's two things. I mean, it's about being flexible. I mean, because we're, you know, here we are post pandemic almost. And, you know, it's about, I think the trend that's going to be leading us from this point forward in regard to the hospitality industry, for example, is health and wellness. Yeah. I mean, I think people are going to be, it's going to take the front seat now. I mean, it's going to, I think, overshadow sustainability. I think it's actually, people are going to be really interested on how sanitized these places are mm -hmm. and minimizing the level of touch. How many things do I have to touch when I enter a guest room? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. I mean, we'd already, we're already working with a couple of brands like Marriott and Tribute and actually Ritz-Carlton and Naples and in um, Hawaii. Um, where, you know, like the accent pillows on the bed, you remember we used to put in the beautiful throws at the foot of the bed, Almost. you know, we don't do, we don't, you know, they've stopped doing that over the last year or so. And I said, now it's going to be a critical path because these items are not cleaned every day. Right. So they cannot remain in the room. Right. So it's going to be about sanitation and automation. I mean, technology has always been an influencing factor, but I think now it's all going to be about voice activated software and minimizing the number of things that I actually have to move, touch, operate, switch on, switch off. I mean, I should be able to do it from my own phone or sure. just do it by voice. So I just don't have to interact with somebody else's germs at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, but the interior design industry, I mean, it's flexibility naturally. And I think that's important but it's also about evolution and just making sure that you understand what the market needs and that you're willing to respond to that. I tell the kids every day and I don't want to talk too much, but I tell um, we have to remind ourselves on a daily basis that it's a service industry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about our gargantuan egos basically dictating a brilliant design at the end of the day and just going, okay, this is what you've got and you're not going to make any changes to it. Right. No, it doesn't work that way. And frankly, it never has. Well, and it's I, not fun if it's not collaborative, right? I mean, that's well, part of the journey. It's about working with the client, trying to understand what it is they're after, giving them what they need at the price they can afford. And like coming up with alternative solutions to your brilliant idea and making sure you can translate that idea into reality at the end of the day. I mean, we have really talented young people here, lots of, you know, generation Y and millennials and all that sort of thing. I mean, there's, you know, 26 people here probably today. I mean, not working remotely naturally, but um, it's like, they can pull beautiful ideas. I said, okay, great. I understand where you're going. I understand your point of view. I understand what the direction is at this juncture, but you need to tell me and to be able to convince me and the client with this checkbook that how this is going to translate and how you're going to actually build this. Because it is a, so definitely we, a heavy service oriented industry. And, and because you're offering yourself 
your client wants everything from you. I mean, there's how many designers, how many hotels, but the difference, like you said, is the service you provide to your clients. I mean, they well, and, and we forget that. And a lot of times it's about acquiescing to your client's needs and putting your own ego up on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we have to take our brilliant idea, the one we were so in love with, the one we were so committed to, and say, you know what, it was a great idea, but it's really not what we're after, and it's not gonna get us um, the ultimate end goal. It's not gonna get us where we need to go. Well, you and need to you know, have the knowledge of what the client needs to sell that concept to the client. And if it's not something mm -hmm. they're interested in, because it's all education as well, you know. Okay, and one. frankly, we, I agree with you 100%. And frankly, we have to listen more. Um, you know, a lot of uh, I w watched a lot of designers over the years, and they will all remain nameless because every one of them is well known. But I've left, I watched a lot of people go into the conference room and just start talking. And I'm like, you know, the person who talks the least amount in the in the room yes. is the one that wins. So true. It's yeah. like you got That's to listen exactly right. to what it is they're trying to tell you. Yeah. And so I've learned that lesson. It's been a, it's been a long road and you know, the good, the bad, <laughs> the ugly. But you, you know, you gotta be man enough to sort of learn from your mistakes and move forward. But, and just you know, but and I digress. Everybody's saying, yeah. And well, take it all in. But well, I wanted to go back, yeah. if you don't mind, you were talking about how those accept pillows and the throw in the hotel those are no longer gonna be part of the luxury. So how is luxury gonna translate now in a hotel room, in your opinion? You That's a great question. And road, frankly for me, it's, it, it's, huh? Well, for because me, it's twofold. Luxury, luxury is about materials specified and it's about space. And it's about the luxury of just negative space, but for me, and I preach this all the time to the kids here in the office, a luxury resort or a brand or, you know, sort of a travel experience, 50% of it is about service mm -hmm. and having access to all the things you need, want, and also the things you didn't realize you needed. Before um, you even realize you needed it, that service level is there. It's anticipating every yeah. thought and every need, and it's, you know, we meet you know, we're meeting with all these new brands like Tribute and Tapestry with Hilton mm -hmm. and like, and they're all trying to define. And I said, you know, it's about access and it's about the experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, the design only tells half the tale mm -hmm. and it's about the service and you know, what it is they're going to get at your hotel, your resort, your, you know, your destination um, that they can't get anywhere else. What it is it, what is it you're giving them? You've got to provide a memory that sticks with them so they'll be encouraged yeah. to return. You know, uh, Kirk, it's interesting because we've been around long enough to see the word experience bounced around so many ways, right? And it's, oh, yeah. And a lot of times, especially when it comes to themed environments, which were m much more blatant, and I think, you know, in the past, they've gotten a little bit more subdued and, and more sophisticatedly applied now. But, you know, the, the, the word experience resonated almost with an aesthetic environment only. And what you're talking about, which is absolutely that layering, is the service side of it, the, 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 the collaborative process between the provision of the service, the environment that's being provided in, all the touch points, whether they are obvious or not, that support that brand differentiation, that is part of that experience as well. In fact, I would go as far as even working through the project with a client and all the operational side of things, that is also experience. So when you say, you know, you're providing- Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's all inclusive. You're, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's all of those things. And, you know, you just can't look at it as a microcosm and just look at the, you know, the pinpoint of the head of the needle. You got to yeah. look at the whole thing and it's really good. And this is what, you know, the best part of the project that I like is when you have the owner and you have the operator, you've got your designers in the room, you've got your architect, your lighting designers, everyone that touches a project in the early stages. And you can table these sort of things and talk about how you can affect change. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like, what can we bring to the table that we haven't seen already, that we haven't experienced already? What's going to make this fresh, interesting, innovative, different? Um, what's going to inspire at the end of the day. And I watch, you know, we go to Hilton headquarters in Reston, Virginia. We've been to Marriott 
headquarters many times in Bethesda. Um, and, you know, we watch these brands struggle with themselves mm -hmm. on how they're going to differentiate them and basically try to define what they really mean. Well, and, and it was, a, was it a, a year or two ago where, you know, it got to the point where, again, I will, I will not name the, the brand or the flag, but, you know, that they were coming up with almost a different brand every month. And to your point, it's like, you know, what is the genuine, authentic value proposition difference between this and that? are everybody who's working towards developing that. On and, the same and, and again, you've hit the nail on the head. They don't know. They and don't know. that's that created confusion. And that indeed sort of created yet another problem. So they're working hard on trying to basically define, streamline and minimize uh, because we don't need 30 brands, you know, that are all sort of mediocre and not basically well thought out or well defined. We right. need 10 really good ones that are clear and concise. Well, that goes but, with yeah, the and, they're, and they realize yeah. that. I mean, we're working with a tribute brand, which is a division of Marriott, and they only have like three or four of those online so far. And we're building a new one for them. It's a new build called the Ellison in Oklahoma City, and um, we base it on, you know, a novelist, you know, um, based on the Invisible Man, and basically picked up on some of the local oh, nice. culture and some of the mores. And we were able to sort of tell a story and work with a branding expert. Mm -hmm. And it was such a terrific process. And it was actually so in depth. Mm -hmm. um, like we'd never gone that far in concept that early on. But you know what? It just, all it did is it wrote the script and it made it so much easier for our designers in office to basically, it's like they knew exactly what it was they needed to do or what they wanted to do to help tell the tale. How, so, how important I mean, it, was, it was it was terrific and we learned so, so much during the process so i mean what could be better than that what is how important is storytelling through that like i mean i find that places that don't um take take a a commitment in a certain direction for me when i walk in no dis, no disrespect to the aesthetic environment but it seems soulless how important well, and and you know i don't want to overuse a word that's really been pan, sort of bandied about quite a bit these days but, you know, the millennials and some of the younger generation, you know, they visit, their travel experiences have to be authentic. Okay, mm -hmm. I get it. You want to understand, <laughs> you want to you understand what the local food is. You want to understand, you know, what actually made Oklahoma City come to be. You want to understand, you know, what, you know, what, what the local industry is all about. You know, what it is that, that you're going to get there that you can't get elsewhere. Um, but authenticity is only part of the story. You know, it's also nice to learn a little bit about the provenance. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, okay, how do we get here? And like, sometimes you have to wrap it around a little storytelling, mm -hmm. then it becomes compelling and you wanna learn more. What you gotta do is draw them in like a good novel, like that first chapter. I mean, that's either gonna tell me if I'm gonna read the rest of the book. Right, but it can still be authentic. I mean, it can still be authentic and not be canned. And this is the thing I think also, just like experience, the word, to your point, the word, the word authenticity has been thrown around so much that it, uh -huh. it's almost like if I'm authentic, I have to be steamed in absolutely every aspect of reality-based surroundings or whatever. I think word authenticity, to me, means that you commit to something wholeheartedly and you see it through on every layer that that you know it's 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 a difference between a a flat front stage you know setting and something that has depth it's the sizzle without a steak is just sizzle right well, and, and and you touched on it you actually said it it's not just about the design and decor it's about every layer mm -hmm. you know it's about the food and beverage and understanding the farm to table and like you know the roots of the recipes and the menus and the ingredients and it's about the signage it's about the wayfinding it's about the materials used and why indeed they were specified and why they might be relevant to the story that we're trying to tell i mean but it's nice that if it's subtle and it sort of grows on you like a fine wine and you let it breathe a little bit and it sort of comes to you slowly i mean in the early days in disney <clears throat> excuse me we had to 
theme, every single light fixture, every fabric, you had to put the hidden Mickeys in the carpet. I mean, right. good right. Lord. I mean, it was extreme, the amount of branding that we had to do, but nobody right. did it like they did. Right. But now it's a little subtler. It's more cerebral. It's more sophisticated. And um, it's actually become quite an art form. And it's it's actually inspired and sort of sired another industry of just concept branding. You know, I mean, what, we're working with people. We're working well, with people who do nothing but that. An idea that everybody, like something that something that's authentic to person A is not authentic to person B. It's your own personalization of the experience. I mean, if, well, you, want got authentic, if you want an authentic experience in Bali, you're not going to stay at a Marriott. I'm sorry. You're just going to stay in a, would you just stay in a local bed and breakfast or someplace? Or it's just. Whatever the concept is, I mean, you have to adjust. Well, the big brands want to capture as much spirit as possible, and yep. it's all subject to interpretation. And you've yep. just got to make sure that you've got to give them everything they need at the right price point. Right. At, the end of, at the end of the day, every owner is looking for a rate of return. Well, right. I, I, want to, I want to ask a question, Kirk, if I may. This is, sure. this, this is um, sort of something that I've always, uh, I, 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 it's almost like a mental game I play with, this concept. And it's, and it's interesting that we basically are very proud in the hospitality industry to say that we are working towards and try to achieve a one-on-one -on -one customer experience, like a unique yeah. experience for each one, right? But yet we are trying, we are prepackaging it in a in a building with three hundred rooms or more. Like it's th th there is certain there's a certain consistency that the brand has to deliver on, but then we still also like to the idea of making sure that everybody's experience is unique. So. Yeah. I've always not struggled, but I've always been challenged and welcomed the challenge of where do you control the environment and where do you leave room for that surprise around the corner, at least to be perceived differently based on your own pre-existing filters or whatever. How far do you go and where is that line? And, and, it, and it's, it changes. It's different on every project. But that to me is actually an interesting thing to try to achieve because to Bill's point, then your experience, your, your memory of that experience is uniquely yours, at least through your own eyes. Right. And it sort of takes, I mean, it leads me to another thought. I mean, the concierge, you know, at every resort, every ho held hotel and everything, I think you have the, the new generation. I see it in millennials and I see it in the Y generation. People are not afraid. Uh, they're not as conservative as, say, the baby, baby boomers like me. Um, for asking for what they want mm -hmm. That's true. and you have to be able to travel and you know visit these hotels resorts these you know spectacular destinations you got to ask for what it is you're looking for and a lot of times it's about getting with a client experience manager or our concierge or whatever they want to call themselves this week right. um <laughs> and basically crafting your own holiday and making sure that you're getting what you need out of the experience and out of the travel and out of the room and out of the spa and all the other things that you plan on doing when you're there. I mean, I think it's a, I think nowadays people are very specific on what it is they need and how they're going to garner it. And I think they're not shy as maybe the earlier generations yeah. about just going ahead and asking for it. It's like, you know, it's like, we want to make sure we have a spa experience. We want to make sure we have a larger room. We want to make sure we have in-room massages on our terrace. Uh, we want room service at a certain hour so we can take a late night dip in the jacuzzi. I mean, I have seen travel itineraries from some of our more well-heeled clients and some of our, you know, owners and that sort of thing. I mean, these things are thought of. You know, before you just got on a plane and you just sort of took, you yeah. know, it, it was willy nilly. You took what may. Um, mm -hmm. now, now it's actually a strategized agenda. And, you know, it's actually pretty fascinating because I think, you know, you're more likely to be satisfied and less disappointed if, you know what, you just go ahead and plan ahead. But doesn't that take the spontane spontaneity away? If you have every... I mean, hour blocked out on your vacation you're it's to me that's not really, that's just me but anyway but well i mean i don't like disagree with, i don't disagree with you you know it's well i think it's it, i think it's a balance i mean i remember basically making a plan and an agenda 
and I don't like the word either one of those words personally because I'm I tend to be not a linear thinker and like right. I'm a good company I'm sure but it's it's you know I, we I went to Spain and there were certain things I wanted to do and I will tell you the best book I ever read and it changed and I've I've traveled extensively at that point. Yeah. It, it is was a book by Rick Steed for Spain, and and the thing that was most impressionable for me out of that book was when he basically says, "Don't ever visit a place like you're not going to come back." So even though I had a list of things I wanted to achieve, I couldn't go to Andalusia and Granada. I had to choose because I wanted to build in to Bill's point a little bit of visiting. Now we're saying I said it to you like we're we're visiting. I think it's a concept that. Maybe it's lost some people that are not from the South, but you know, you sit and you visit and you, you have a certain structure of a, mm-hmm. of, of a conversation, but you also uh-huh. have a lot of room for that, that happy accidents, that, that, that going down a rabbit hole, exploring an idea with somebody else. Yeah. Go ahead, Kirk. Yeah. yeah you, no, you said you it. I mean, it, it's, it's about taking the time, you know, no matter where you are in the world, um, you know, we've done work in Saudi Arabia and places I never thought I'd have the opportunity to, to visit as, you know, being a poor boy from Alabama, um, is just making sure you take the time to absorb um, the local culture because you know what? It'll make the memory a lot more meaningful for you. And now we have all the, you have to take all the photos and post them on social media, your selfies of all the places you've been and done and things. I think that detracts from the authenticity. What what do you think about that, Kirk? What's the impact of social media on on the industry, on our experiencing? design I think, you do a I lot think of social good. media I you know I like to I just started years ago I mean just playing on Instagram and you know I just enjoy it just for the heck of it um just because I'm a naturally curious human being but right. um now I think it's critical path I mean and especially post pandemic I think a lot of people are turning to Instagram Instagram live they want to interact because a lot of people have been isolated mm-hmm. and this is how they experience like what they th- have come to term real life and they want to live their life. They, they, they want to dream through you. They want to see what you're up to, where you're going, what, you know, what you're doing. And they basically can idealize you and they can learn more and they can actually plan, you know, their next excursion. So Instagram and social media, I mean, Twitter, all that. I mean, that's where a lot of people are getting their information now. That's where they're getting inspiration. Uh, that's where they're interacting with their peers. I think it's more critical than it's ever been because people have their smartphones. And you know what? That is, I mean, completely the voice of the future. And if now, we don't realize that, that, that we're just not paying attention or we're not listening. What'd you say? How does, how does that impact on design and all the social media and posting vignettes of your work and tabletop and everything that do you feel that that influences people to purchase things or to contact you or I, think it, I think people idolize and i think they want to mimic and i think the exposure on social media so and so many different design styles and so many different things can create that need or that want and i think it's a big part of human nature and also about travel i mean you know we're post-pandemic right now People are sort of a little bit timid about traveling, but you know, it's part of our DNA. And I think people are going to get back to travel. They're just going to travel very differently. They're going to travel more safely and more consciously. Um, But I think, you know, by seeing that their favorite celebrity is in the Maldives this week at this incredible (laughs) resort, that's what they dream about, you know, and, you know, we, we underestimate and living in Los Angeles, I've been experiencing it for 30, 35 years, but, you know, we underestimate the influence of celebrity culture because people idolize these folks that they see on television or in their favorite movies and that sort of thing. And on their reality TV series, you know, the Kardashian influence, I used to call it. Um, but we oh, lost we lost Kirk. I hope he gets back we on. We lost here. Kirk. I'm sure we we'll lost get him Kirk back. here. We'll get him back. Um, but um, uh, I just I, I want to just kind of follow up with with what was he was saying. I I I am I'm a person that basically struggles with this because where is the authenticity in that celebrity culture? But I will also understand, and it's been, been amplified for me during this, uh, you know, pandemic, is that we have um, 
a need for escapism. And I think social media, it used to be movies only that provided escapism. Yeah. Movies got to be too expensive. Now we are, uh, you know, we're seeking other forms of escapism. And I think if anything, you, we are doing so more so in the last couple of months because of this pandemic and being, you know, sequestered, basically. So escapism mm -hmm. takes on a different reality, a different importance. And I think social media for a lot of people is escapism. Now, the danger with escapism, as always, is how much of it is escapism that's healthy and how much of it is where you're basically almost to the point of denial. And it becomes not healthy. So with that, with that, um, with that being the benchmark, I think everybody has to make that decision for themselves. I think I think there's no. Avoiding. I'm sorry. A Kirk just texted me. He said he has a power outage. Oh, okay. Well, we can we can definitely. But I know what you mean about the authenticity because, like I said, what? So you go to Mexico and you want an authentic experience, but just by the fact you going to a concierge in the hotel and saying you want that you should go and have that experience yourself you well, and, well that. and i saw I, I saw a report bill and i hopefully kirk can join us back in and i'm, I'm keeping an eye out for him but you know <clears throat> i want to thank him if he is not able to i really want to thank him for taking the time to be with us today i think yeah. it's really a, a, a great that was, i texted that it was really great yeah. right yeah see, see would you if you don't mind text him while we're, we're continuing this to see if he's able to come back on we're looking out for him. Love to love to end the show with him on camera. But if not, I'd like to just con continue this conversation. I think right now, the idea of experience, if you really stop, and a lot of people have the time to stop right now, if you self-reflect, mm -hmm. experience is very important. But experience, like anything else, like just like technology, just like anything, experience can be many things for many different people, different things for many different people. And, and I, there was a report I saw about a year or so ago where it took almost like an economics approach to experience, the idea of experience. And what I mean by that is it measured, and economists will, will understand this term maybe more, is the, the diminishing rate of return. Like if you invest yeah. in something, okay, you have a diminishing rate of return usually. And that's really has to do with, um, just interest, durability, whatever. Imagine when you buy a car for the first time or you just buy a new car, okay? Mm -hmm. And the, when you buy it, there's a level of excitement. There's a, there is a rate of return. That's yeah. not just the fact that you have a car that will last you a certain number of years. It is also a rate of return that involves um, your expectations, your feelings, oh, the smell of new leather, you know, all of this stuff. And over time, like in a lot of product-based stuff, the m measurement goes down. It has a m diminishing rate of return. Mm -hmm. The lower time, it becomes a car that you don't care about the scratches. Right. You, you're not worried about buffing out the, the, tail, the headlights. Yeah. And eventually, it just goes on to the next car. And then you go through the same process yeah. all over again, right? So this, the, the thing that's interesting is um, uh, I, I have somebody called Michelle trying to get on. Is that uh, from Kirk's office? Will you text him and see if, if he's trying to get on as Michelle? Maybe he's using somebody else's phone. Uh, if so, we can I can let him in. Uh, but to finish that thought, so so one of the things that this report basically said is that the one thing that does not have a diminishing rate of return, yes, is experience. Meaning, if you invest in experiences, if you invest in travel, if you exp in, 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 it's not the travel, yeah. it's the experience that you get out of doing that journey. Right. It's the journey, right? The process of going through the journey. That rate of return is not dim in diminishing rate of return. And, Excuse and me, that is, he is trying that to is, get on. Okay, let, 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 let's bring back Kirk on here. Um, and, and we could get, Kirk, are you back? Or, 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 or Michelle, are you back? <laughs> See, there you are. The best laid plans. Best laid. <laughs> you know what? This, this, I mean, this, this is went black. I was like, okay. This is this is how the sausage is made, ladies and gentlemen. This is what this is what happens. But <laughs> something I, I was, like that. Yeah. No. Um. I. I. So again, anybody who's joining us, Mr. Kirk Nix is on. It says Michelle on his screen because I'm. I'm guessing he's using another apparatus. To Michelle's. But uh, oh, it, I'm on Michelle's laptop. That yes, explains. Right. So. Mr. Kirk Nix has been with us, and thanks for joining us again, Kirk. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, no, I'm 
and we're having a great time. It's been a good conversation. I feel like we just like scratched the surface. We have so many other things to discuss, you know. Well, I, we were we were we before before we lost you, we were talking about sort of experience and 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 the way that it's been implemented and what it really means and so forth. And I was sharing with Bill when you were off off camera with us is I came across a report a couple a couple of years ago regarding the diminishing rate of return. And it took the idea of experience and it took the idea of product and it said the one thing that basically has a non-diminishing rate of return is experience. Right. And it actually used a very funny example to prove it for people. It said, imagine when you're in a relationship and things go south and then over a period of time, you actually have an increasing rate of return because you remember the positive aspects of an experience. And so it right. was talking about like, if you invest in travel versus you invest in a new car, if you invest in a product, or you invest in an experience that one of the very few things out there that basically has a non-diminishing rate of return over time is experience. Mm -hmm. That was a very oh. fascinating, you know, way you to look at relive that experience when you travel over and over in your mind, your memory. And it gets better That's actually over time. Well, again, it's most experiences, maybe not every experience and generalizing, but I think it was a very interesting way to measure uh, something that's sort of non-tangible, maybe in certain mm -hmm. ways. Well, I, I think you're right on target. But for me, it's, you know, travel, because I grew up as a military brat. So we, we moved around quite a bit. I was an only child. I kept my own company very well. Um, for me, it was all about sort of let's just learning new places and creating memories. Um, you know, I've lost my father. He was like 93 years old. He had a really good run. I lost him about five years ago. And now my mother's 88. And so she and I are creating new memories together. So it's all about, you know, we, we travel and we and we will travel again. And we're just trying to create new experiences. And, you know, you only go around once and we want to make sure that, you know, we wake up in the morning. For me, it's about having no regrets. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure that, you know, we were curious and we got out there and we were, did the necessary investigation. We tried it and we don't know if we were going to like it each and every time, but the only way you it. know, you got to try it. That's anyway, the that's the only way you know, right? I mean, really. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about this major crisis that we're dealing with. I mean, obviously, you know, hospitality industry. I mean, I had to remind somebody the other day that the word hospitality comes from the word hospitlers, and it actually had to do with protecting the, the pilgrims on, on the path to the Holy Land. So there's been a health component and a protective preventive component to this thing forever. And we, it, 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 the industry that was on fire is now basically facing, you know, 80% lack of occupancy for the moment. There, there, yeah. there, you know, there's some serious, genuine impacts and challenges that, that, are com that, that we find ourselves in. What do you think, not focused necessarily on hospitality so much, but what do you think are the challenges that are facing us coming out of this coronavirus? And what are some of the opportunities? Well, yeah, for me, I mean, I've been, I have a very good friend who's like the West Coast director for Hyatt Hotels. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, the new, the new build projects that are already funded, they're moving forward. So that's a great thing for like our industry as well. Right. So I'm like, happy to hear that. But he said they're not really developing any new projects new. on top of that because what they're trying to do is they've got to figure out what the new normal is and they're developing a new paradigm, basically. It's like, you know, the, again, as we discussed earlier, there's, it's about health, safety, sanitation, wellness, and basically making our guests and like all the people that want to travel, making it safe and comfortable again for people to venture out of their homes. Because again, they've been terrorized by mm -hmm. CNN and the news and all the stuff that they've seen online. And now it, it's time to create a new comfort level so people will come out again and basically resume their, you know, their daily lives and their dream vacations and all those sorts of things. I, I have to tell you, Kirk, we're, we're, we're working on a project in Texas. And one of the things, and it's just, it's just we're basically brought in as kind of review and, and another set of eyes on yeah. um, the A&E group there for the spot component. And one of the things that was immediate Oof. is we started looking at things to your point where there's a psychological component, there's a proof component that needs to be achieved here to ensure people, to assure people that their, the environment is not only safe, but they can let their guard down enough to basically enjoy it. 
And so one of the things that we were doing is we were basically putting in an equivalent of a, not full fledged, but an equivalent of a clean room instead yeah. of massage rooms, you know, where uh, sanitation stations that are not, you know, ad hoc thrown in to meet compliance, but are part of an overall hygiene and wellness process that, sh again, shows authenticity and commitment to that as a offering in that property. Hyatt is a great company that is leading the way in that, you know, with the Maribel purchase and all that stuff, but- it, Oh, it, they're doing great. Yeah. And then, but one element that we haven't discussed yet in regard to all this is social distancing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had a meeting yesterday, you know, we did, we designed and built the, you know, with the ownership, of course, uh, the Hotel Wilshire in 2010 on Wilshire yeah. Boulevard. It's a boutique hotel. It's operated by Kempton. It's 74 rooms. It was a conversion of a medical building. And we're renovating it. And um, we're about to start the purchasing and the actual renovation of the roof deck, you know, new furniture and, you know, right. some new layouts and that sort of thing. And we met with the ownership yesterday and we realized that, you know, uh, the roof deck, the capacity was originally like 83 seats or something like that. It's like, in order to be responsible, we've got to cut that in half. Mm -hmm. And so basically- And does that pencil well, out? Does that-, does that Well, pencil? I mean, I took out a red pen and we basically relayed out the entire space and figured out how, you know, we could make everyone comfortable and we could create sort of natural and unnatural and sort of like, you know, um, organic barriers, you know, sort mm -hmm. of make the experience still look and feel right but again, not making sure, you know, ensuring that people are not too close to one another. How do we offset the financial impact of that? Like, is there, because, you know, those drinks are at a certain price point, you're not going to double them to make up for the difference in capacity. You're not, you know, is it, is it, does it become the new normal? Does that new normal as a benchmark of your commitment to my health and well being? Uh, does that, do I look at that place and I go, you know what, the fact that it is more exclusive, not as, as packed, not as many seats, does that now become an appeal to me to go there as a consumer, as a spender of discretionary income? How does the, this, how do these companies that have been operating in terms of real estate development forever on the concept of maximizing square footage, again, Luxury product take, deals with it differently, you know, restaurants. That came up yesterday as well. I mean, how do, you, how do we do that? Well, it's, they have to look at the rate of return. And so what it's going to do, I mean, just logically is it's going to decrease the amount of money that they have to invest in this. They have to basically minimize how much cost there is because they're not going to get the return. They're not going to get the money out of it. That they're putting into it. I mean, we already had a preconceived budget on this roof deck renovation, and we're already, you know, basically value engineering it, you know, a word that you know very well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're basically taking it all down because we have to basically limit our exposure here because, and again, we're not doing full meals to start with. It's going to be light bites and basically custom crafted cocktails. Um, because, you know, you can charge $18 for that. We can make it about the muddling and the extra creation mm -hmm, of the cocktail because mm -hmm. people want to take that knowledge and they want to take it, try it at home. Okay, got it, understand. Um, but they can't do as much as they once did because, mm -hmm. again, they're not gonna, they're going to lose money. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting reality. I mean, you got, you got competing author, uh, uh, authorization agencies, you got competing, you know, guideline generators, you've got, you got the corporate component that's basically built on a maximized profit model that is now being challenged. I got to tell you, as, as much as it seems overwhelming, there's a part of me that's super excited for us in the industry that choose to embrace this because it is a problem solve a problem that needs solutions and creative pivoting is critical as part of this, and you just listed everything. And I, you know, I was I was grinning because I totally get it. But some people may not realize that that the, the what is on the plate, what the plate looks like, what is on the menu, what does that menu look like? I mean, I used to joke about with HBA, you know, that we have a shared sort of legacy there. I used to say, you know, HBA, we handled everything from the wrapper on the soap to the logo on the uniform of the valet parking, and everything in between. And 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 so it's total the, branding. I mean, it's basically. Branding. You've Space, got to space, do spatial branding. We do. Yeah. We do a three-dimensional spatial branding is what we do. That's all it is. And but I have to say, I mean, it's going to be a new world because we have to navigate. 
-hmm. you know, what we're actually physically be able to provide in terms of like seating and service and how many people actually fit in the space and like how an operator is going to basically change their bottom line mm -hmm. to continue to survive so they can move forward. And again, maybe, you know, six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now, um, they can return to mm -hmm. you know, some version of, of where they want. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I, I, it's I, a fluid I, uh, market because no one really knows what's going to happen when we go back to what normal or no there, i don't think there's a going back to that normal i think whatever it is we'll no. a new normal and i don't know that it's a yeah, and i do, and i don't want to be fatalistic because i think right. we need to sort of like I, we have to be optimistic we're going to come out the other side of this there's going to be some lessons learned mm -hmm. but again people are intimidated they're afraid um, they like don't that. want to be infected. People with immune, you know, compromised systems, that sort of thing. They have to be very careful. I mean, yeah. again, we have to take it seriously. And yeah. we have to assuage and address their concerns and how we, you know, how we make it safe and nurturing. And we encourage people to come back out and see us and do what they need to do and restore the economy. So everybody and I mean, everybody can get back to work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, you know, we're worried, but again, it's about diversity. So, do, you know, the hospitality industry, it's going to come back, but it might be a slow start. Yeah. You know, the, re the residential industry, yeah. But again, it might be a little bit more focused on wellness moving forward. You know, I mean, the there, there's a company, I don't know if you know about this company, I don't want to digress too much, but it was called Delos. Have yes, you heard of yes I, I know the I know the guys at Delos and on well, I met you know um a good friend of mine ended up sort of going to work for them and they came to our office and gave like a brief presentation. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating technology. It was mm -hmm. basically taking, you know, they're for very wealthy clients. It's not an inexpensive right. system that you basically add to choose to your new build residential track mansion or whatever it is you're building. Yep. But it's, you know, they're smart houses is what they are. Mm -hmm. You know, things that, in, you know, basically anticipate your needs. They basically, it's filtered air. They can have Himalayan salts in the air for wellness. Uh, the wow. lighting, the lighting, the HVAC, it's all controlled right. to your circuit circadian rhythms i mean it's fascinating and i see a lot more focus going into that sort of thing because yeah. people are going to want to insulate they're going to want to make sure that their homes are really safe healthy environments and their retreats they're basically the respite at the end of the mm -hmm. day and yeah. I, I see a lot more people nesting and mm -hmm. so i see a big business in that the 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 we're, I'm looking at the same thing. I mean, I've got, I've even had on another show, the Rad Life that I do. I, I've had people that have come on that we're talking about air quality. We're talking about how to basically retrofit for air quality. I mean, and, oh, yeah. and again, there's a lot of mm. there's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of kind of greenwashing, if you will, equivalent. There's stuff that's legitimate and it's worth the investment and it has a long uh, return. Uh, you know, life cycle on it, but, and, and it's going to, it's going to affect everything. It's going to be homes. It's going to be hospitality. It's going to be everything from a fast mm -hmm. casual to a sit down, you know, dinner. It's about well being, And that's what we're selling. It's basically, it's like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be safe. You're going to live to tell the tale. And, you know, you're going to come out the, the other side of this and you're going to be all the better for it. So that's all it is. What, do, what would you, what would you build? Did you have a question? I was, um, well, we've talked, we've covered a lot of things, but like I said, I think we should have another one of these uh, next month or something, because you have a lot to offer, Mr. Nix, and we really... <laughs> I talk too much, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think everything we well, covered is valuable. There's a lot of topics valuable, that we still yeah. haven't even covered. I would, you mentioned at the very beginning about you started doing this when you were 11, and I'd like to hear more about that, and I'd like to hear more about your curiosity how did how did, how did you get how did you get into this like was it a conscious decision kirk that you wanted to pursue this was it something that led to something else i've never asked you that question 
Well, you know, like I said, I mean, I might have mentioned before that I was a military brat, so we traveled mm -hmm. a great deal. And so my world, because I was an only child and I had to keep my own company quite a bit because I spent all my time around adults, is was books. And that was my early version of travel. That was my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And my parents actually had some of the pretty picture books, which we now refer to more eloquently as coffee table books. Mm -hmm. And I have a collection here because... I kept buying them as I got older. And now that I've crawled up there a little bit, we have 7,000 books here at the office. Uh, now the kids don't use them. They look for their inspiration online, but every now and then I'll see somebody <laughs> taking a peek, pulling one off the sh shelf and taking a peek. But I started with coffee table books and I, I realized what life could be mm -hmm. and that we could, we could basically design our own life. And that was interesting to me. And it was about not creating a safe haven it was going out and sort of seeing the world and realizing what was important to you and what spoke to you as an individual. And I went to college at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I mean, not the most sophisticated place on the planet. Roll Tide. And I had always, <laughs> there you go. And I, you know, I wanted to study architecture. And then, you know, after, you know, uh, six months to a year of drawing foundation and piling details, I thought, well, you know, I, I'm more attracted to the pretty. So we, I moved to the interior. And the, the most important thing I did during that time was I took engineering drafting classes and taught myself how to draw. And that actually made me marketable. Yeah. I mean, when I got out of school, people were like, what, you could draw? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I can, you know, I'll give it the old college try. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having a nice hand and, you know, that's how I ended up sort of getting into the hospitality industry because I was cutting sections through entire hotels and, doing lots of pretty things and you know what because of the travel just, I, I remember it was an evolution it was an evolutionary yeah. journey for me I, I i remember looking at those sections on the second floor of that mezzanine in, of design one at uh, the maria del rey yeah it, that oh well that i mean we could tell some tales about oh, that God, like, we, that's, that's a that's a totally different show that's gonna require a few cocktails <laughs> my friend yes and and for those who don't know i'm sorry but we can't tell you right now uh, it's, it, 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 yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating how I think if anybody's watching this, that, that we have excitement that's still there that is, that is palatable doing what we do. And I'm, like I said to you, like yeah. this thing right now that I'm hearing about this challenges and, you know, six foot separations and every other table in a restaurant is gone and all these compliances that have to be, which may be around, may not be around after six months or a year, but I will, I'll tell you, if you look historically, wow. I saw, a, I, I, I listened to a fascinating NPR podcast about a, three weeks ago, and it was about the connectivity between infectious diseases and how bathrooms have been designed. And yeah. the materials that are basically used in bathrooms today, the stuff that we put in the Corians and the Caesar stone and all that stuff that we basically apply in residential now, which we used to see only in hospitality and commercial, those things basically are right out of medical responses to things that happen. You know, the, the Absolutely. Story. Right. So there are some, there are some, as you've said, there are some lessons to be learned here. And if we aren't listening... I mean, the whole industry is going to pass us by. So there's, it's important that you pay attention to what the industry is asking for. I mean, you know, the, it's given us lemons. It's important we make lemonade. I hate to be, you know, an old wives' tale, but, you know, it's important, it's important that we pay attention. Uh, what, uh, okay, I mean, you kind of covered, I think, the answer, but for somebody who's starting right now in this industry, right? Uh -huh. What are what what is maybe two things that you would tell them? I mean, I know one of them is probably going to be stay curious, right? And always basically. Well, I think. Hunger. Well, you know, I used to have a mantra around here when we first started the company 15 years ago. I'm like, kids, you cannot design five star hotels unless you go see one. Like, you know, the SBE hotel opened around the corner from our office yeah. right here, you know, in West Hollywood. <laughs> And it had been open for six months and I realized no one in my office had been. I said, are you out of your mind? Right. I put everybody in the car and I said, come on, we're buying drinks and we're gonna go experience. We're gonna see a room, we're gonna tour the penthouse and we're gonna, I mean, you've got to go see things. So that goes back to being curious. But the second thing is, and I basically say this to every new hire, don't come to the table without a point of view. I mean, basically form an opinion, understand what you like, why you like it, 
And then basically, if you're going to sell me a design or work on a project together, I want to understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I want, I am amenable to any rational opinion. I mean, if if you can sell it to me, it's Mm -hmm. like, I'll buy it, but you got to be able to sell it. Well, you got to believe, you got to, you got to be, you got to, I hate to use the word again, authentically believe. Well, you got is. you got to believe. Yeah. Just have a point of view. Got to believe. Have your I don't, I'm not interested in a vacuum. I'm not interested in yes men. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in people pulling things out of magazine that's not really understanding what the what it is they're looking at. Yeah. I said I want to understand why you do what you do. That's all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's pretty simple. And, you know, it's like, you need to be engaged. I mean, there's a lot of people in this industry, you know, they're doing it for a paycheck and there are a lot of people in the industry because they're just damn good at it and they deserve to be here. Well, I think, I think on that note, Bill, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, can't think of a better way to end the show. <laughs> I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. It's been great. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk, very much. Uh, for and those- have a wonderful week. And maybe we can do this again next month. I'd, I'd okay. like to do that. Maybe we can come up with some other topics. Because I mean, it is it is a very varied field, and 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 the, right now the crossovers between residential or the lines between residential, hospitality, even elder care, you know, senior housing, mm-hmm. multi units, uh, spas, wellness in general, they're so blurring. There's a and, lot. There's a lot of big industries out there that need to be defined. Um, I mean, we're all growing older at a rapid rate. I mean, thank God it's everybody else but me. I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, it's like you're 11 years old. There's a huge yeah. senior um, population that's going to yeah. need addressing and soon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. We, I've never worked on any senior facilities, but I'm curious because I'm seeing a lot of development there. And um, well, I'll, very, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll t- interesting. I'll talk to you There's more about, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you and talk to you more about it. I had an opportunity to design a 122 bed memory care, three story ground up. And yeah. Up. Yeah. And, 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 and there's a lot of layers. I've been, I've been certified aging in place since 2008. And so th- there's a lot of layers to this that are nuances like uh, chromotherapy, uh, memory, me- uh, music memory, uh, you know, things of that nature that you build into the system to encourage mobility to encourage uh, self-guided for people that imagine this. I mean, the challenge of basically providing self-guidance to people that are losing memory, their memory. Well, also it's important that they engage on some level. Otherwise social, social, they just become breathing vegetables. And that's absolutely. not the goal. No, it's no. So people social, have to engage so they don't, you know, it actually slows their progress as well. Yes. As yeah. No, social socializing is huge because one of the major problems to that vulnerable population is isolation and it has a cascading negative effect when that happens. It, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating area, but again, to, to what I was saying is it pulls in on health, wellness, even spa treat, treatments that are appropriate, programming for fitness that yeah. is appropriate, of course, nutritional, uh, nutritional components, you know, and, and again, the, like you said with millennials, it, the expectations are a lot more sophisticated. You know, the people, we used to joke and say that people are spending, you know, so many hours on HGTV and travel channel. And that's why our job got so diff- more difficult because they're exposed. Well, now multiply that by a million because of something like this, right? I mean, it's people's expectations are such that you have to have a fully they're integrated. Much, they're much, you said it, but it's much greater because we have access to so much more information. Therefore, right. we've just become more dangerous. I mean, we just we just know a little too much about everything. Well, right. gentlemen, I, I appreciate spending some time Thank with you. two dangerous it's people. Been great. <laughs> that wasn't too bad for my first time, was it? No, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. I, I do. I do want to acknowledge Bill. This is his first time basically doing this, and he did a great job. Kirk, thank you so okay, much you. for being with us. Well, I really, it was really so good to catch up with you. We need to catch up on a personal level as well. So let's do it again soon. I would love that, actually. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. You too.